Good evening, everybody. We're going to wait another minute or so to make sure that everybody is getting into the chat. We see people coming in right now. Thank you all for coming. Thanks, Dan. <clears throat> All right, should we get going, Rod? Sure, let's rock and roll. All right. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. My name is Stan Schreier. I work alongside Brad White at the North Sales Northeast location at Salem, Mass., just north of Boston. Um, let me tell you a little bit about Brad, who's going to be our presenter tonight. Brad uh, spent his college years sailing on the Charles River at Boston University. He was the team captain there. Uh, Brad. When Brad was in college, they didn't do crew All-American awards, although we probably would have been one if they did give out the awards. Um, but another interesting fact about Brad was that he did crew for Sandra Ray, who was the first female All-American, first female co-ed All-American in the history of college sailing. Since then, Brad's won eight major, champ eight major championships, and he's been a sailmaker for 35 years. He can repair your sail, he can build your sail, he can tell you anything you need about need to know about sail materials or design for your boat, and that's what he's gonna do for us tonight. So I'll turn it over to Brad. Thank you very much, Stan. Uh, thank you all for signing up for this event tonight. Uh, sorry we can't be together in person. Uh, the actual person who moved this forward was a fellow named Dan Rigdjink up in the Piscataqua Sailing and Kittery Point Yacht Club. And uh, Stan is a customer, I mean, uh, Dan is a customer. And uh, he's been great. He's called me on occasion with great questions. He's a retired airline pilot, so he knows about aerodynamics. Uh, anyway, he's been great to have along. He's got a little 26 footer that he loves to sail. And uh, I wanna thank him for helping organize all this stuff. So tonight, uh, Stan is gonna move along with the slides while I talk. And he's going to ask some questions. I hope all of you come up with some good questions. We can't address all of them. Uh, we do have kind of a limited time zone, uh, but let's make it interesting. Let's make it fun. We'll kick it off. Uh, and because uh, we do want to go sailing. Uh, the fact of the matter is, you guys, I'm not going to say a whole lot of new stuff tonight. I will remind you of things that you were learning, that you've learned on and on for the years that you've been sailing. But the goal is to reignite some of those memories and get you to think about your sailing and how you can actually improve it a little bit, especially if you're racing. Um, but part of my gig here too is to address cruising sailing because it's the same thing. It's all about trying to optimize your sail shape for a given wind condition. Uh, sails stretch, the rig moves and so on. So we've got a number of different controls on our sails that we can use to help us actually change the sail shape for the conditions. In light air, you want your sail set one way, and in heavy air, you want it set another. So let's just pick on the mainsail first. We're gonna talk about a few of the controls that you've got there. Uh, the primary ones are, on the screen, you can see the main sheet, which controls the angle of attack of the sail to the wind, also controls the twist in the leech of the sail, which controls how much power you might have in it. The traveler, alone controls angle of attack, so a bit of redundancy there. Your vang controls the twist in the leech of the sail. So between the traveler and the vang, you've kind of got a redundant main sheet. When we get to the backstay and mast bend, I kind of lump them together, they control the depth in the body of the sail, as does the outhaul, which controls depth in the foot of the sail. Your halyard and your cunningham both control draft location, and that's more of a matter of uh, uh, which is easier to use. Clearly, the Cunningham is there to make it easier to control where your draft is located in the sail. So when you're using your main sheet stand and trying to figure out the angle of attack, <clears throat> the, it's pretty clear that the wind is hitting the boat at a certain angle, depending on if you're beating or reaching. And if you ease your main sheet or you drop your traveler to leeward, the angle of the boom to the wind gets closer and closer to zero and the sail starts to luff. As you're beating and going upwind, obviously you wanna trim those sails in. So for the most part, if you're racing, not necessarily if you're cruising, you carry the boom about on a midships 
Now I say about because all of you will find the sweet spot on your boat. Generally, I've got a Pearson 33 and that sweet spot falls between right on dead center line, depending on the breeze. This is, we're talking six to eight knots. And I might even hike it up to windward just a wee bit, just to give me a little bit more helm and a little more point in the boat. Um, at this point, we can talk about the traveler too, because when it gets really windy, you might use the traveler as a quick release adjustment to change the angle of attack of the sail. If the boat is getting overpowered in a puff of wind and you want to drop, the, uh, you want to ease the amount of load on the wheel, uh, prevent the boat from healing so much, you can drop the traveler down very quickly to account for that. That dumps air off the sail and it also changes the angle of attack so that the boat doesn't heal as much. Yeah, Brad. Um, don't load up the keel. Brad, there is a little bit of redundancy between these controls. So can you tell us how we might prioritize which ones we may want to adjust when we're trying to make a change in either our sure, angle of attack or twist? Yes, I alluded to that a little bit when I got onto the Traveler. It's generally, uh, on a lot of boats, it's the easier of the controls to make gross adjustments to the angle of attack. The main sheet is there, but it requires overhauling a fair amount of line. So if you've got a good workable traveler and the boat is getting overpowered, suddenly a puff comes, maybe it's that puffy Northwest day up in the Gulf of Maine, and a big puff comes, the boat goes rail down, and you think, oh my gosh, what's the quickest way I can relieve pressure on the rig, the sails, and the rudder? Well, the fastest way to do it, if it works right, is your traveler. Um, if not, for sure, the main sheet. Now, I know on a lot of cruising boats, the traveler may not be quite so adjustable. So you pick your poison and uh, use the one that's easier to use. Um, the main sheet also, as I said, controls the twist. So when you ease your main sheet, and I'm going to talk about this with the general a little bit too, that allows the boom to rise and allows the leech to twist. So in the next slide, you can kind of see what I'm talking about here. The boat on the left has got a pretty tight main sheet and the Genoa for headsail is strapped in pretty tight. Um, I like to think of my sail plan as one wing with a leading edge and a trailing edge. How the air exits off the leech of the Genoa onto the main is very important. And so you get clean exit of flow off the sails and the most amount of efficient flow. You're trying to reduce drag. Now, the sail on the right, if you look at it closely, the upper part of the leech is opened up to let the air spill off. Perhaps this boat maybe came into a puff of wind, although it's just a kind of a caricature, but perhaps it came into a gust of wind. So the skipper, the trimmer, eased the main sheet, raised the boom, and the sail twisted off like this. What you look at to see if your twist is appropriate are the telltales on the leech of your mainsail. They should be flying, streaming pretty much aft. If the sail is trimmed down too hard, if the main sheet is on too hard, the top telltale at the top batten will be stalling around behind the sail. And that's a really clear indicator that your boom is down too tight and the, the main sheet is hauled on too hard. So to relieve that and get the flow going, let the ease the main sheet up a little bit. A little bit might be an inch, maybe two inches, but it's not much, it's not six inches. So look at those telltales. Generally, when I'm sailing upwind, I like my top telltale to be stalling about 20, 25% of the time, maybe a little bit more. The outhaul and your backstay control the depth of your sail. But first, let's look at the outhaul. Outhaul controls the depth in the foot of the sail. There are two types of mainsails being built, more loose-footed sails now today than sails that are attached along the boom. The outhaul controls the depth in the foot, like I said. Now, when you have a loose-footed sail, it controls about the bottom 30% of the sail. If the sail is captive to the boom and has slides on it, when you ease or adjust the outhaul, it only affects about the bottom 10% of the sail. So vertically, you get a much better shape using a loose footed sail. Combine that with your backstay, which will bend the mast and thus 
flatten the sail in the upper sections, you can blade the sail out quite nicely. Now, there is a chance that you can overbend the mast with your backstay. And you would notice that because you would have a wrinkle that would run diagonally from the clue at the end of the boom up to the mast, oh, maybe about halfway to the bottom spreader or your first spreader. <clears throat> And that's a pretty good indication that you might have bent the mast a little bit too much. The other thing about bending the mast is it will open up the upper leach of the sail. So that's how you can flatten the sail. Think of your outhaul as a way to stretch the foot of the sail along the boom, even though it may not be attached to the boom, and your back stay to bend the mast, which deflects forward and flattens the sail in the middle of the mast. Right. Um... How can we uh, manipulate our mass bend if we don't have a backstay? Oh boy, I, that was a question asked me earlier today. And um, you can use it by changing the amount of tension on your shrouds. For instance, your cap shrouds want to compress the mast. And by compressing the mast with swept back spreaders, that forces the middle of the mast forward. You can reduce that bend by tightening up your lower diagonals. But you have to be careful because rigs are, believe it or not, rigs are very, very sensitive. And I'm a fan of sailing with a little bit of a looser rig because my boat, my Pearson 33, needs a little bit more horsepower in the forest day and in the mainsail. So if you don't have a readily adjustable backstay, um, generally like on a cruising boat, what you'll do is you'll find a sweet spot, sail the boat every now and then, find a sweet spot, and tune the rig for the season that way. Uh, honestly, I don't have an adjustable backstay on my Pearson. So I set it up pretty much in the middle of where I know it makes the main look pretty good for most conditions, and that's it. From there, I use my outhaul, and I can use the main, the main hide or the cutting hand to adjust where the look draft is. So it gets a little bit more difficult with a rig that doesn't have an adjustable backstay, but eh, you know what, you make the best of what you got. So the location of your draft is pretty important. That really determines how much power you've got in your sail. Draft forward means you've got power maybe through waves. <clears throat> you have a couple of ways to control the draft. Your halyard tension and your cunning hand. And if your halyard tension is tight, you won't have any wrinkles along the left. <clears throat> but like in this picture here, that pulls the draft nicely forward, gets it right up forward near the mast. If a hired isn't very adjustable, again, getting back to the question of which control is more adjustable, then you might use your Cunningham. Cunningham is a little six part system on the uh, down at the tack of the sail and yank on that, take the wrinkles out of the left of your sail and that'll pull the draft forward as well. But generally what I use as a rule of thumb is to just pull the wrinkles out a little bit, just to get rid of them a little bit. If you, generally, if you go much tighter than that, you might've gone too tight. So I kind of laugh at Stan and I were going over this the other day and I kind of have a couple rules of thumb. If you're sailing and it's getting windier, the harder it flows, the tighter it goes. I've used that since I was a kid sailing little boats. But when in doubt, let it out. So if you sail your boat enough, you'll kind of find where it feels like it's just, it's released. It wants to go. And if it feels a little bit bound up, like it's kind of wanting to go sideways or you're fighting the wheel or something, let your sails out a little bit, just a little bit. And a little bit means maybe half an inch or an inch. You'd be amazed at the difference. So Brad, I do some sailing on a FAR 40, and uh, we ease our main halyard on the runs to power up the sail a little bit. And I was on the dock one time last summer talking to somebody who said, no way, I would never do that, because if we round the lured mark and we didn't pull it back on, then we're never going to get it on going upwind. So what's your opinion there? Is that the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do? Well, first of all, I'll say that guy should pay attention and take care of his job. Like Bill Belichick says, do your job. Um, but aside from that, accepting the fact that so often you've got 
I'm going to just say a crew that might not be professional. Maybe you had to drag somebody out of bed the day before because you just you fell short on crew. So you might have somebody who's not exactly in tune with what's going on boat. So that's okay. Um, practice definitely helps. Um, I would always ease my hire going downwind. Absolutely. It helps put more draft in the sail. It just makes the sail a more forgiving, softer shape. Um, there are lots of tricks to going downwind, uh, but that's a good way to, to trim your sail going downwind. And as far as remembering to pull it up before you get to the leeward mark, the tactician should not jam the boat into the mark. I'm not a fan of that. Come in relaxed. Everybody knows what's going to happen. Everybody knows their job. Everybody knows the speed at which it's going to happen. They're comfortable with the amount of time it's going to take. And you can get it done. I sailed with a guy on a FAR 395 years ago who was a, a really persnickety guy on the bow. And he was very, very concerned about getting the spinnaker set up in time and so on and so forth. And one time I just said to him, John, have faith in your ability. You can take care of this much faster than you realize. It doesn't take you three or four minutes to do it. It takes you 45 seconds. And he learned something about his own ability and we got better and better and better. Moving on to head sails. Sure. Um, head sail also has controls. Uh, and I think probably the thing we're trying to get on people's uh, radar here is that um, the controls are there to help your boat sail more efficiently, primarily for racing boats. But let's talk a little bit in the cruising arena. I have my Pearson 33. I don't race very much. When I do race, usually the barbecue is going on the stern rail and we're having burgers and having a good time. Um, I admit, I don't adjust my sails all the time. I use my main sheet, my traveler, my jib sheet. Um, I don't have a backstay that adjusts. I don't even have a Cunningham. But I know the boat and I know that it likes to be sailed a little bit on the fat side. So that's where the Genoa comes in. Um, and what I'm kind of getting to is that I adjust what I can adjust. Um, my days of the high tech panicky racing are that, that's fun, but I don't have to do it all the time. On the Genoa, we've got four primary controls. The Genoa sheet, which it controls the angle of attack and the twist a lot like your main sheet. Uh, if your boat is set up with a barber hall arrangement, that controls angle of attack. Stan's talking about a FAR 40 just a few minutes ago. Uh, boats like the J109 and so many of the more modern designs like a barber hall, the, the efficiency of the hull going through the water allows for the sails to be trimmed in so much tighter than the old days. So barber hall is a good thing. Your lead car position, which controls twist and fullness down low. It's almost like you're out hauling your mainsail. And of course, your halyard controls the draft location, but some boats even have a Cunningham on their headsail. So if we look at the controls, <clears throat> here we got the, uh, the jib sheet. So if you look at the orange sail in the picture, uh, if we were to ease the jib sheet, it's not the best sort of diagram, but if we were to ease the sheet, what happens is the twist, which is the right curve on the sail from the clue to the head, actually would, would actually twist more, especially up high. And along the foot, I'm sorry, the, the, I've got the sail sideways. The twist goes from the left edge, but that curve would be greater. And the foot is on the right. So, right, Stan. So when you ease the sheet, the first thing that happens is the clue rises, the sail twists off. If you're sailing in heavy air, a really good thing to do at the, at the top end of your sails wind range, say it's a light medium one or a medium one, and you're getting up to the 15 knots parent type of condition, you might wanna move the lead aft. Say you've got another quarter mile to go to the top of the beat. If you move your lead aft, you're gonna flatten the foot of the sail, just like the foot on your mainsail. And that'll also twist off the top of the sail a little bit so that you can actually carry the sail up to the winter mark, not bothered with a sail change before you get there. So moving the lead aft on your Genoa is a lot like the outhaul on your mainsail. It flattens the bottom of the sail and will allow more twist in the sail. 
So that sounds like a pretty powerful control though, because we flattened the sail while we really twist it open at the same time. Oh yeah, oh yeah. And you can see it on the rig, uh, with the way the sail sheets in to the spreaders. Now, where is the right location for the lead? Your Genoa telltales that run up along the luff, like in this picture here. Um, generally speaking, you want the telltale streaming pretty evenly aft. The one near the tack, the one in the middle of the sail, the one toward the head. Um, if anything, to achieve the most efficient flow, the top telltale should be luffing just a little tiny bit before the middle and the bottom telltales. This sail here is an interesting picture because it's showing me that this lead is probably too far aft. What you've got in the bottom of this sail is a very, very flat shape. And you can look at the leech up high and see that it's, it's pretty far away from the spreaders. Right. So my guess is what the telltales are looking like on this sail is down low, the lured telltale on the back side of the sail is stalling hanging down, no flow there. And up high in the sail, the top draft stripe, that telltale may be actually luffing. So the solution here would be to move the lead forward a little bit, a little more power in the foot area of the sail and bring in the leech a little bit. That'll happen simultaneously. Brad, do you recommend marking things like where our leads are and our sheets are when we think we have fast settings? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, there are tapes you can put on your deck if you don't want to mark it up with a Sharpie. Um, it's very, very helpful. And that kind of goes along with if you're racing the boat fair amount, uh, keeping a log of your successes. Uh, it's nice to note the mistakes and failures, but to log your successes on when the boat feels really good and when you really sailed well is a really important piece of knowledge, a lot of pieces of knowledge. In a kind of perverted way, I think that we all get on our boats and slow them down. Because there are a bazillion ways to make mistakes on a sailboat. From everything from weather forecasting to tactics to boat handling, sail trim, go, 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 you name it. Um, so if we, were, if we left all our boats to themselves, they'd all end up tied <laughs> at the end of the race. It, weird, huh? So a boat, uh, this is one of our controls that we have is uh, the, the amount of sag in our head stay. And I call it a control. It is in a masthead rig. It's directly related to the back stay. Um, but in essence, what happens is when you've got a bit of a sag in your head stay, that's more power. When do you want a, a little bit more power in your head stay? Perfect spot is just at the start. You're in a pack of boats and you want to get off the starting line with as much speed as possible. You want to be able to accelerate as fast as you can. So in that situation, I would have a little bit of a softer back stay, which correlates to a little bit of a softer head stay and ease your sheets a little bit. Um, twist off the main a little bit, ease your general sheet a little bit. You got a little bit of twist. You hit the line, you do your final trim, the boat starts to build speed. Uh, if your crew is tuned in, then you've got somebody looking at the knot meter saying speed build, speed build, speed build. And as that's happening, your trimmer on the mainsail and the Genoa, listening to that person, can start to crank the sails in very, very slowly, just a little bit at a time, as long as your speed is building. If you get to the edge of the cliff, so to speak, and the speed starts to fall, then you may want to ease them out again. I think it's fine to foot off the starting line a little bit to get the speed to get out ahead into lured of the competitors on your windward hip. If you can do it, it's a great thing to do. When in doubt. Let it out. Stand learned. So one thing that a lot of people uh, have asked about and you see on the top racing boats in any fleet anywhere are what are called speed wrinkles. And this is an old picture, but it's a good picture because it shows it really, really nicely. A couple of things. Number one, um, you know it's a lighter day because there are people sitting to lure it on the boat. I'd like to see them move forward a little bit, get the rear end of the boat out of the water some, but it eh, wasn't my boat. 
Um, but more importantly are the speed wrinkles on the left of the sail. And what those do is that tells you that the luff in the entry area of the sail is slightly flatter than it would be if the wrinkles aren't there. And what this translates to a little bit more ability to point, maybe a half or one degree higher than you otherwise could. Flat water and light air speed wrinkles are fine. Um, off the starting line, maybe you don't want them. You want some power to get up to speed fast. Then relax the luff on the heart of Mount Genoa. Let those wrinkles come in and start to point. When the breeze builds and you get waves, typical boat needs a little more horsepower to go over the waves, just nature happening. And so you need to kind of get rid of those wrinkles. And getting back to what I said a few minutes ago, my rule of thumb is just pull the wrinkles out a tiny bit. Now, one kind of, kind of classic scenario is you're sailing in, say, Marblehead or uh, anywhere USA, where there are fishing boats or power boats, anything going around. You got a lighter day coming on, you got a fine race going, and that massive power boat roars by in front of you and leaves a big wake. You're sailing along because it's hot water and light air, and you're doing a booming three and a half knots, maybe four knots, but you say you're really flying. As you approach those waves, tighten up the Cunningham or the halyard on your Genoa, and bring that draft forward to give you the punch to get through those waves. Once you get through the waves and the boat settles down and, the, and you start to build your speed, then you can start to relax the halyard or the cunning hand and let those speed wrinkles come in so you can go into point mode again. It can be deadly. It can be really, really good. So that halyard or jib cunning hand or both, they're pretty dynamic controls in light air, it sounds like? Oh, they can definitely help. There's no doubt about it. And uh, again, it's, it's one of those controls and adjustments that if you can use them and use them effectively, uh, it's one more thing in your arsenal to just get your speed a little bit faster than the guy next to you. Two boats side by side uh, in handicap perf racing or something like that. Uh, if they rate the same, then theoretically they should go through the water at the same speed. And so if you're tending to these little controls more than the guy next to you, uh, particularly in a one design boat, it really shows up fast on those boats. If you're in a one design boat, if you're making these little tiny adjustments, and again, I say tiny, it's a half an inch, three quarters of an inch, um, you're gonna give yourself a little bit of an advantage. So it's a constant, constant adjustment. And likewise for wind velocity changes, we deal with that all the time. So, you know, you gotta kind of be on your ears. And uh, I know our, our Stan, our college coach used to say, shifting gears. If you can shift gears effectively, boy, you keep the boat speed up. We're playing it, what we're playing with you guys is we're sailing against the rating. In handicap racing, we're sailing against our rating. And the higher you can keep your average speed up to the theoretical boat speed, yeehaw, you're going to do really well. That requires a lot of gear shifting. If you sit there, set it, and forget it, you're going to miss so many opportunities to keep your speed up. So there you have it. All right, let's go downwind. Cool. Uh, downwind. Uh, a lot of times people break out the sandwiches, open a can of beer. Um, I've always been a Not huge bad fan idea. Of, <laughs> uh, it's always been my, my contention that you can make more money going downwind than you can upwind because most people fall asleep. Um, obviously today we're between downwind sales. We've got symmetric sales out there and we've got asymmetrics. Uh, and there are ways to control the shape on these sails. Uh, there are things you can do to help your average speed stay up high. Um, so we'll kind of go through those and remind you of the things you already know about how to keep your boat speed going and how to take advantage of going down with it. On the symmetrical sail, got the classic four guy and a topping lift. And that controls the outboard end of the pole and how high it is above the deck of the water. On the mast, you've got some sort of track or maybe two pole rings to control the inboard end of the pole height. 
<clears throat> the guy or the sheet, the guy in the sheet, control the angle of attack and twist. So how the sail is trimmed relative to the wind. What I like to think of you guys in the, uh, when I'm going downwind is I'm sailing on a field of tumbleweeds and the tumbleweeds represent bubbles of wind that are rolling across the water. And if we can stay in a bubble of wind longer and point the bow down deeper, a few degrees deeper, we're gonna reduce the amount of distance we sail to the leeward mark. It's a phenomenal, uh, phenomenally powerful way of going downwind. And to always think about staying in the most wind you can. So first of all, let's talk about a symmetric controls uh, and then we'll go to the asymmetrics. On a symmetric, like I said, you've got your outward pole location. It's height controlled by the top and lift and the four guys. The sail on the left, the pole is up pretty high and the sail and the clue on, the, on that sail is drooping down pretty low. The drawing here shows how the droopy clue actually closes down the leech of the sail and starts to affect the way the sail, the wind flows off of that sail and into the mainsail plan. Not the most efficient. On the other side of the screen on the right is a picture of a pole too low. And on this one, you can see that the leech is twisted open too far. So you're giving away a lot of sail area up high. You're not using the sail efficiently so that the airflow is not passing onto the mainsail and you're actually slowing the boat down. So the rule of thumb is to try and get your pole high enough or low enough so that the clues of the sail are pretty much even. Uh, we don't know, need to go to that slide yet, Stan, but we got one coming up that shows that pretty well. So look at your spinnaker clues and try and make them an even height uh, above the water or just so visually they look like they're pretty even. The next slide shows where to put the pole relative to the wind angle. So yes, two ways to look at that, maybe three. One, I like to look at the pole relative to the ripples on the water and pull it back pretty far. So it looks like it's square to those ripples or in line with the ripples. It also should pretty much line up with the mainsail boom. But the really good indicator is the top of the mast. If you've got a masthead fly up there, look up, take a look at it and square the pole to that. Now, Again, just like the mainsail and the Genoa, going down when your controls are not static, don't just sit there. For instance, on a Swan 42 Club racer, uh, when we would be in conditions where we might be able to catch a wave, they don't even need a very big wave. Boy, would you start to grind the sheet to bring the pole back, pull the boat forward so the bow can get over that wave and actually start to surf the wave. It's a great way to accelerate the boat. And then you need to ease things. So with a pole pretty much square to the wind, your foot of the sail is stretched out pretty far, but it should never, ever be stretched. Okay, I think we lost Brad. Sorry, I was just trying to figure out if uh, I lost him or you did. So um, I'll pick up where he left off and hopefully we get him back. Um, uh, so again, Brad was talking about um, uh, moving the pole around to, um, you know, if you're gonna bear away and surf a wave, moving the pole around to square the, um, square the sail back and you're gonna bear away. And then when it's time to head back up, the pole goes forward again. It's also important to recognize when you have a velocity increase, maybe the pole needs to uh, go up a little bit or a decrease, the pole needs to go down a little bit. And that can be a little bit of a counterintuitive concept, but um, 
back to thinking about keeping the clues of the sale even. Um, generally with a symmetrical sale, where the windier it gets, the higher the sale is going to project and it's, it's just going to be further up in the air. The lighter, the lighter the air is, the more the sale is going to droop. So that means poles are generally lower, um, may generally be lower to match the clues in light air. Um, relative to heavy air. And uh, really when you're practicing, it's important to go up to the front of the boat and take a walk around because um, you can't see the lured clue a lot of times. So you don't know where, um, you don't really know if they're even or not. So it's important to take a walk around and look at the, look at the sail when you have time to when you're not racing. Um, our next slide here, uh, this was one that Brad was alluding to. Um, the pole on this boat is way too high. And um, the spinnaker sheet may be choked under something on the lured side, but you can see that the leech of the sail is way too closed off. And um, it just the sail is just not flying right. Now, this is a little bit of an extreme example, um, but it's a good illustration of what happens when your pole's too high. Um, Next slide here. Um, this boat is, the spinnaker on this boat is in good trim. This is an older Blue Yankee boat. This was a su successful boat. Um, and uh, you can see that uh, the pole height, the, the, inner, the inner side of the pole and the, out, and the outer edge of the pole are in the same spot. The clues are nice and even. The leeches look good and the sail's drawing pretty well. Um, one thing that we will maybe do want to point out here, um, the leech of this sail, sorry, the leech of this sail of the main sail is maybe a little bit too tight. It looks like it from this photo. Again, this is generally a well sailed boat. So that may be the way that that boat is happy. Um, but uh, it does look like the main sail on this boat could use a little bit more twist. Um, now, one thing that's important to notice too, sometimes when we're looking at photos, is this photo is just a snapshot. Um, so maybe the boat was in trim the rest of the time. Um, it's kind of hard to say. Um, now we're on to our symmetrical symmetrical sails, um, and um, this is an example of. Um, uh, the, the sail on the left has the, um, the tacks floating up in the air, the sail on the right, the tacks cinched down, down to the deck. Um, some symmetrical sails, you never want to ease the tack off. Um, this is an area where it is important to know your boat and talk to other people that sail the same boat as you. Um, uh, but a good rule for a boat that when you know you're soaking, when you're really trying to work for depth downwind, um, uh, if you ease the tack up some measure and the tack rotates to windward, then you're probably soaking low enough that you're, gonna, you're, you're doing the right thing. And the luff of the sail, the whole sail is gonna project around to windward more and you're gonna project more area um, to the windward side of the boat and it's gonna be a more efficient sail shape. Um, if you ease the tack off and the tack falls forward, then it's not the right thing to do. It means you're sailing too hot an angle. Um, so you really don't have really ever wanna ease the tack line of a symmetrical sail off if you're doing any kind of reaching at all. It's only something that you wanna think about doing when you're sailing um, dead downwind. Um, but it can be a powerful maneuver and something that you may change gears on a lot. Boats like, you know, some of some sports boats like J70s, um, Melges 32s, it can be a powerful thing, especially in light air to ease that tack line and, um, and it can give you more, more ability to soak to leeward. Um, and you can see this boat on the right here, um, they're sailing quite low and uh, they've got their tack eased off and the whole spinnaker is rotating around to the windward side of the boat. Um, the boat on the left is sailing a little bit of a hotter angle. They've got their tack down and that's the right thing to do. 
um, then you can see the boat that's in the background in the picture on the right. They're sailing a higher angle and they still have their tack off. It's probably not the right thing to do in that case. Um, uh, and again, the whole guide there is which way the tack goes when you ease it off. Um, with symmetrical sails, you don't have a lot of ability to manipulate the shape of the sail. A lot of it is in the design, but the tack can be um, a powerful way to change gears with your, um, with, or sorry, with your asymmetrical spinnakers. Um, <clears throat> sail material, on to sail material. Dac run sails, great price. Simple engineering, pretty good performance, and they're very durable sails. Um, Mylar Dacron laminates, good price, good engineering, good performance, good durability. Mylar tech material laminates, pretty good price, good engineering, better performance. And you know, you can see this list we're going as we go down, um, we're getting more expensive probably better performance. Um, on the other hand, we're not seeing as many mylar tech material laminates as we used to. Um, 3DI molded Dacron sales. Um, this is a relatively new product, good price, very good engineering, very good per performance and very durable. Um, so they're gonna be more expensive than say your regular Dacron sales, but Maybe, I, I mean, it, it depends on the boat and what you're buying them for, but maybe a better value because they may end up lasting a lot longer. Um, and then lastly, uh, 3DI molded composite tech sails. Um, they are expensive. They're engineered very well. They have great performance and they have excellent durability and um, they're being used quite a lot with a lot of our modern race boats now. Um, they last a long time. Um, the uh, you know the um, Volvo Ocean race boats now go around the world 25,000 miles, um, and they do that all on one mainsail. Where um, you know even 20, 25 years ago, uh, around the world race boats would um, go through three or four mainsails. Um, these guys are doing it with virtually one one set of sails. Um, and uh, the old uh, the old ocean race boats, they would have sewing machines on the boats to <laughs> to work on the boats. Um, you know, they needed like real skilled sailmakers. Not that there's not skilled sailmakers on those boats now, but they're there for their sailing ability more than they are for their uh, for their sailing skills these days. Um, now we're not all going around the world these days, but again, those 3DI molded Dacron and composite. Um, Molded composite sails, they're very durable. Again, though, they are more expensive than your Mylar Dacron laminates and your Dacron sails. Um, so a lot of it does have to do with what your budget is. This is a great shot of some Ensign sailing in Newport. Um, great day. Ho hopefully we're all able to get out on the water and do some day <laughs> get some sailing in on days like this again this summer. And uh, these are your traditional uh, Dacron cross-cut sails. Your choice of sails also is going to have the class rules for are going to have a lot of bearing on what um, what you're going to be looking at for your sails. Um, the uh, you know some sails don't permit anything other than da some classes sorry don't permit anything other than Dacron cross-cut sails. Um, Here's a Dacron Mylar laminate. This is on a cruising boat. Again, very durable sail. These boats are gonna last a long time. Here's your Mylar, tech, My, Mylar laminate sail. The 3DI Nordac sail. Um, does look a lot like the cross cut sails, but it's a molded sail. It does not have panels. Um, this is, again, this is a relatively new, oh, Brad's back. I'm back, I'm back. Sorry about that, everybody. <laughs> Don't ask me what happened. <laughs> Who knows? 
Anyway, um, where were you, how'd you do stand? You well, we got together? into, I hope I did all right. We, we were getting into SAM material, so we'll go back a couple slides. And um, I did just run through our list of, uh, <laughs> You know, um, you know the, these five things, and talking yeah. about you know price versus durability. But you might have a couple things to, that you want to add. Um, well, um, how did how did uh, you feel about the downwind stuff? Everything good there? Yeah. Yep. Okay. All right. Good. Blasted right, so, through it. <laughs> uh, good. Nice job. Thank you for covering. Um, so um, uh, Stan just went through this list of the sale materials and what might be best for you. Um, Kind of always, I like to ask customers, people who sail, what kind of sailing they do, where they're coming from. Do you just cruise? Uh, if you were to put a percentage of your sailing on cruising versus racing, how would that work out? Um, do you sail with experienced people on the boat or do you sail single handed? Do you sail with people that are just guests that really aren't capable of? helping, they're just there to have a nice time and relax. Um, and it runs the whole gambit, runs the whole range. Uh, so there's a sale, really there's a sale out there for everybody. Price is an issue, durability is an issue, performance is an issue. That's the next step of the conversation. And to just kind of ask people, you know, what's their priority? Uh, some people prioritize price. Some people are willing to pay a little bit more for a little more performance. Uh, with a little more performance, you're gonna give up a little durability. And so you kind of walk down the path and figure out what might be the best options for any given boat owner. Um, and that's cruising, racing, uh, anything. So to kind of walk through them, starting at the, the uh, most cost effective, the best price are the basic Dacron sales that we've seen for a long, long time. Pretty simple engineering. They go together easily, quickly, and you get a, Pretty good performance, very good durability. The woven material is very good durability, so that's nice. Woven material lasts longer. The next step up the ladder are your Mylar Dacron laminates. Um, they're good price, better engineering, radial cut sails are designed more around the load paths that are on the sail. Uh, and this was an evolution out, of course, the racing arena back in the 70s and 80s. Um, good durability, reasonable price. Um, not bad for somebody who mostly cruises, but does their 4th of July club race and maybe their Labor Day race. Maybe they do a little bit of Wednesday night stuff. Uh, then we would get into the Mylar with technical materials such as Kevlar and carbon, uh, any blend of that sort of stuff. And as you get into the more high-tech materials, of course, you're going to go up in price. Uh, the engineering is good, um, better performance, less stretch. Uh, carbon is the lowest stretch uh, material that's, that we've got out there right now for most cruising type sailboats, uh, racing type sailboats. So it's a good thing for racing at a good price. You do give up some uh, durability because the laminates with the Mylar film uh, tend not to hold their lifespan quite as long as a woven sail. And remember the word woven, that's really important. The primary thing that we found at North going forward was that mylar was very good for making material, but once the material is made into a sail, mylar becomes, it's just part of the sail. The yarns in the sail are actually what's holding the shape of the sail. So we investigated and found out, how, gee, how can we get rid of the mylar and still have a good sail? And that was when 3DI, three-dimensionally interwoven, woven, keyword, sails were born. So these are sails, much like the string sails that were built uh, for many years, that are built on a mold, a three-dimensional mold. So envision a three-sided trampoline frame, and underneath it are a lot of jacks that push up battens that run from leech to luff on this three-sided frame. So when Stan's sail that I've sold him comes up on cue to be built, the mold that's been dedicated for his sale, we've got a number of molds in Minden, Nevada, and Sri Lanka, and, and uh, places. The mold for his 42 footer is bent by the designers, by the program, to the shape that they want the sail to be in a given wind range. And so the sail is pre engineered, it's pre shaped. The material I've sold, Stan, might be Kevlar, it might be 
carbon, it might be Dacron now, Dacron tapes. And those are laid on the mold. And they're laid in such a way that they address every load path that's conceivable that the computer understands that might be seen by that sail in its range of wind. So this got developed first with the 12 meter America's Cup stuff, not the 12 meter, the uh, America's Cup stuff and the bubble boat races and the Grand Prix race market. <clears throat> the tricky part was, was how to actually address the cruising market. And a lot of research and development went into it. The development of new adhesives, key number two. So we've talked about no more uh, mylar material. We know that woven material is super durable because when it's woven, it can't delaminate. The third part of the equation is the adhesives that are being used. We walked away from thermoplastic adhesives, which are used in most laminates. Laminate's a bad word. And now we use thermoset adhesives. Thermoplastic adhesives are always curing and they will give up the laminate after a while. Thermoset adhesives are inert once they're cured and they stay that way forever. Thermoset adhesives with a woven tape sail on a mold hold their shape better and have tremendous durability. So we started out making the 3DI molded sails for the technical boats. I might, maybe I should have reversed these in flip-flop, but they're not set here on when they were developed, they're set here by value and what they're appropriate for. So we learned from those 3DI composite tech sales, particularly the Volvo boats. And here's something interesting. During the early days of the Volvo and prior to that, the Whippers. I'm sorry, I told that story already. Oh, you did. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so we found out that these sales are incredibly durable. When we started to prototype the 3DI molded Dacron sales, we found a number of boats that we could use as prototypes and sent them off around the world. And these guys has logged 50,000 miles and the sails are still in great shape. So we said, wow, this is really pretty cool. Let's open this up to the public. So I think that was uh, three years ago in the spring where we made the 3DI Nordac sails available to the average cruising customer. They have proven so good, uh, almost too good. Uh, we got so a weight that, savings with those sails too? Somewhat in the early, very early stages, they were actually uh, overbuilt uh, on the side of durability. Uh, so one of the things we did last year, the year before, was we went on what we call the weight savings program and looked at the sales in ways that we could actually save weight and still have the durability. And so there's been a nice happy medium met there and the sales are really proving to be not only durable, and not only lighter, but they hold the shape really, really well. So the molded sails that are woven tapes. Um, Stan, did you go over what, how the tapes are made? I didn't. Okay, so many of you may remember the days of the string sails. And you could see fairly good size, call them thousand denier diameter yarns in the sails, running from tack to head to clue, tack to head to clue. Um, and so what we did was we actually, a yarn is nothing but a spun bundle of fibers. And they form a yarn, just like you go to the county fair and you see the person with a rabbit and they're spinning the yarn and making a sweater right next to it. Um, it's no difference. So what we did was we reverse engineered those yarns, unwound them and made those fibers lie flat on an adhesive tape, pre-impregnated adhesive tape. So now you, when you pull the backing off of those tapes, the, what you have, the remnant left, is a super thin, ultra thin tape. It's about four inches wide and forever long. So when the sail is built, the tapes are laid on the sail, on the mold, into the sail. Now we know we can't really bend a four inch wide tape, some of the curves that are in the sail to account for the loads. So the tape is run out a prescribed, a prescribed length, maybe three feet, maybe four feet, then it's cut. The gantry that's laying down the tape backs up, starts another tape, goes at a different angle around the corner and around the corner. The corners, the corners and the curves are nothing but extensions of, sh of short straight lines. 
So by doing this and interweaving them and overlapping them in scarf joints, you get a tremendously durable interwoven sail use, using thermoset adhesives and the woven tapes. So they're really, really strong and they're really, really durable. And I have told people, I think that uh, they really are changing the way sails are made, the way the big head tennis racket changed tennis, the way the big club uh, changed golf, and the way shaped skis changed skiing. So it's really pretty cool and very exciting. And this technology is even spreading down into the downwind sails. I think Stan might have checked in on that a little bit ago. But not only are we building downwind sails, the code 55s, the 65s, the code zeros out of um, good laminates, but we're also now building some of them out of uh, the 3i materials. So it's all very exciting and uh, certainly worth looking into at some point. What else you got, Stan? This brings us up. I was just running through the slides. I was talking about how much I like this picture. I'm ready to go there. I know it's really pretty good, and and uh, it almost reminds me of that collision between the two J boats just a couple weeks ago down at St. Mark's. <laughs> <laughs> the red boat looks like it's going to climb right into the cockpit. It, it does look like a close call. <laughs> um, but it's it's kind of interesting, you know. You look at you look at the two boats, and a couple of things you can pick up on here. Number one is how tight the foot of the Genoa's is on the rig, and that it looks like the leech is, you know, twisted off okay. Uh, the boats look fully powered up. Freebird, or Firebrand, Firebird on the left. Um, the reason he's behind the white boat is because the guy is sitting to leeward. Uh, all the important information is up on the windward side of the boat. Get off the leeward rail and sit on the high side. You can tell a whole lot more. Now, Give him the benefit of the doubt. Maybe he went down there to see how close he could get in this crossing situation, but uh, whatever. I would always sit on the windward side of the boat. It also kind of looks to me like both of these boats have their travelers pulled up a little, maybe a little bit higher than you'd want, uh, particularly the red boat, because it looks like that rail is digging in. And if the rail's digging in, then you probably have uh, the boom pulled up too high. You got too much pressure on the main. Free it up, free it up, free it up. When in doubt, let it out. Yeah, that's right. Uh, here's a, this looks like a, uh, maybe a Beneteau or is it the Swan, I think. Yeah, it's a Swan. Um, it's a nice, nice boat, whatever boat. it is. Yeah, it's a Swan and it's, uh, it's a good picture of the laminated Mylar. There's probably carbon in these sails because it's a big boat. Um, the radial panels are one of the early attempts when the sails were being designed for paneled sail material to address the change in direction of loads on the sail. So it was a pretty good effort and uh, the sails are pretty smooth, so that's good. New addition in there in the last 10 years are the vertical battens, allowing the battens to be on a in-mass furling mainsail or a furling jib, which is a really nice thing. You get to have sails that are actually reasonably good uh, geometric shape, which is good. The boom is the midships on that main. Uh, the jib is trimmed in, that boat's going to weather just fine. Not healed over too far, it's got a lot of horsepower. And this is your sort of traditional string sail uh, laminate. Looks like it's Kevlar sandwiched between layers of mylar film. Um, fully batten, so that's a good thing on sails, I think, from a service standpoint. The sails tend to last longer. Uh, and what do you mean by Brad? What do you mean by string sail? Well, the the yarns you see there are laid in the laminate. Um, there, these are actually not continuous. Uh, the tack to head to clue. This is a copy of a North 3D I sail, a 3D L sail, and the yarns that are there carry the load. Uh, you can see the seams running across the sail. And although it looks like the yarns actually go across the seams, this sail was built on a flat plane and glued together uh, much like a panel sail. It just has the load bearing yarns in it that, uh, you know, it does help hold its shape. There's no doubt about that, but it's uh, not as uh, good at holding its shape and nor as durable as a 3D I sail, no.
Three D Iron Turns. Oh, sorry, I skipped one. That's there we all go. right. Yep, 3D Iron Nordak, great cruising material. I think I heard Stan uh, talking about how it looks kind of like a crosscut sail. Uh, there are scarf joints in it, uh, on the bigger boats in particular. And uh, so they may show a shadow through the sail. But in fact, those are just the areas where a lot, uh, it's about eight, 15, 18 inches wide, depends on the sail. Um, and the sail on the mold was put together and these were interwoven so that the pieces all tied together and then the adhesive was activated and the sail came off the mold in one piece. And you can see really the vertical shape in that sail, top to bottom is just amazing. We got another picture coming up that'll show it even better. So this is 3D Iron Nordic. The 3D Iron Endurance was the first sails that were uh, type of 3D I sails that were built for the Volvo ocean race boats. And uh, again, they proved their durability way beyond what was expected. So uh, very happy with those that have come. This set of sails looks like it's a uh, carbon or Kevlar and Dyneema Spectra blend, uh, which is a really nice durable combination. These sails are gonna last a long time. So Brad, uh, sorry, let me come back to this slide. So not all of these sails are gonna have the same materials. It's gonna depend on what, one may need for their boat, is that correct? Yeah, and that's a good question, Stan, because sometimes we get uh, people who say, well, can you show me a piece of the material? Well, we don't actually have the material until we build the sail. So what we try to do is to sell you the appropriate material for how you're gonna sail your boat. And this material comes in, in tapes, ultra thin tapes. Picture a piece of crepe paper or uh, something as light as tissue paper for sure. That's what one of the tapes is. It's, it's like that. We do have a sample at the loft. Um, and so it's kind of neat to show that. But that, I think that sample is just uh, carbon and Dyneema. It, do, it doesn't have the Dacron in it uh, and, or the Aramid. Yeah. And uh, so it's super duper light. A, a sail like this, this is probably an 80 footer. And the clue of that Genoa, that jib, probably has, I would say, close to 80 or 90 layers of tapes in it, all emanating out of the clue to address the loads that'll come out of the clue when it's under load. And it doesn't add up to a lot of thickness. The corners are all built into the sail. The batten pockets are built into the sail. There's reinforcing put on the outsides. Um, the reef reinforcements are built right into the sail. Uh, it's a pretty cool way to build a sail, no doubt about it. And this is a sail, this is a J105. And a few years ago, the class decided, okay, 3DI is a pretty cool product. So let's make it eligible to be used in the class. We'll make it, use, uh, make it okay by the class rules. And this is an example of the 3DI raw racing carbon sail. It's lighter, it's more fragile, yeah. And, uh, but boy, they hold their shape and uh, they've proven themselves super duper fast. Um, you go up with, this is an all carbon sail and you go up that ladder and you do get to some uh, fragility problems where the sails don't last forever. I'm not gonna kid that, kid you that. But for the guy who's really racing his boat hard and really wants to go to the high end regattas um, and you will find that uh, the 3DI raw product is really pretty sweet to have. Brad, we got a question about whether certain materials may be easier um, to roll or furl. What would you say to that? <clears throat> um, that's a good question. 3DI, because it's as strong as it is, is built you know, relatively light compared to a Dacron or a laminated mylar dacron sail. Um, one of the things that can be done to these sails, I, I think they're easier to roll. They, they're less bulky in a nutshell. Uh, they are firm when you get them, like a new pair of jeans, they're quite firm. Um, but I think that uh, what you'll find is that over the course of time, the sails soften up a little bit. The adhesive that's in there and the woven materials are plenty strong. So it's not a matter of that. Uh, and so the sails will definitely um, roll into a rig 
say a boom or a mast easier, or even around the headstay. The other thing you can do is you can coat the sail with a McLube coating, which will help the sail as it rolls, slip against itself and roll tighter. And here's a picture of a laminated sail being used as a downwind coat sail. This is probably a code, a code zero or a code 65. Um, like I mentioned a little bit ago, the materials are being explored and they're getting better and better. Uh, these high-tech boats, the Transpac 52s and boats that are super high performance, love the asymmetric sails. Uh, they're going so fast that the apparent wind is, is most often quite far forward. So they love going uh, with these A sails uh, because they can just keep the boat whipping downwind. And the VMG is so much greater when they're reaching and planing than if they were to point the boat dead downwind, that they are going more and more with asymmetric type of sails. Cont the, the development of these sails has come so far in the last five years. And in discussions I've had with some other guys uh, in the company and on the water is that, let's take a Sunday afternoon guy who leaves Marblehead Harbor or on my Pearson 33. I leave with some guests out of Salem and I turn the corner and I go, okay, where's the wind coming from? I'm not going to beat into the wind. So I crack off and I reach in front of the breeze. I reach down. I, you know, I go down 15 degrees. And then I get down, say, past Baker's Island off of, off of uh, Manchester. And I go out of ways until I figure I can tack easily and then fetch over the shore side, the offshore side of Baker's Island. So I can crack off again a little bit. Turn the corner to the west some, crack off a little bit more, and then finally home. So it's kind of a big circle and it follows the wind the way it bends around Mass Bay and Marblehead, Salem Bay and all that. And so really for what I do on my Pearson, a coat sail, like a code 65 would be perfect. And I think- Yeah, Brad, what... I heard you and our chief designer, J.B. Braun talking the other day, what have these laminate materials done for, you know, for these reaching sails, the code 55s and 65s? Well, they've expanded the, the sails have such a much wider range that they can be used in, particularly with the helix luff load sharing concept. Um, so they're getting a wider wind range, a wider wind angle range and velocity range. So kind of what you see in what I described about my sailing, my particular sailing uh, is, boy, I could have one of these sails on my boat and instead of rolling out my 135 Genoa, I could pop out one of these guys, rip down past Baker's, rip down on my Pearson 33, <laughs> <laughs> and then turn the corner and, you know, roll it up, do a tack, get to the other end and rip back the other way. And it'd be fun. It'd be easy. So I, I think it's changing. I think you're going to see, especially in some of the more modern designs, that have a larger mainsail and a smaller jib. I think these coat sails are made perfectly for that. I really do. Okay, Brad, we should wrap it up. Um, do, you, do you have anything you want to say in closing? Well, I, I I'll certainly can take a couple of questions. I want to thank everybody for putting up with us. And um, I apologize for the technical difficulties. Um, you, you will all have, or you have gotten my contact info. I'm available. Call and ask questions. I love it when Dan calls. It's a riot. He always has good questions. And uh, give me a jingle. If I can't answer it, I can probably put you in touch with somebody you can. Um, I haven't been sailing all my life because I'm not dead yet. But, uh, you know, it's a lot of fun. I'm very lucky to be able to do it. And I'm happy to pass along any information I can to any of you guys, wherever you are or whatever you're doing. Yeah, we didn't get to all your questions, so and uh, so I'm sorry about that, but please uh, reach out to Brad via email, and he'll get back to you with questions we didn't answer. Awesome. Thank you all for coming. Thank you very much. Good night, Stan. Bye-bye, Brad. Thanks. You're welcome.